YouTube. If I see Anna, yes. Camila, give a yes when you're okay. Um. So, we'll take it away. So is everyone in already? Or... Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, boa tarde, todo mundo. Uh, Para quem precisar, uh, quem quer ouvir em português, a gente vai dar umas instruções. If you want to keep listening the original audio, it will be mostly in English. Uh, you don't have to do anything. Mas se você quer, quer ouvir em português, uh, a Camila vai dar umas instruções. Camila, você está mutada. Oi, gente. Boa tarde. Se você precisar de tradução, você pode clicar em interpretação ou interpretation e clicar em português. Se você tiver no celular, você pode clicar nos três pontinhos e também clicar em interpretação e selecionar português. Obrigado, Camila. So we have English from now on. Uh, welcome again, everyone, to the second meeting of this second season of Savvy Talks. Uh, my name is Bruno Lastorina from Instituto Caminho do Meio. Uh, as you already know, uh, Savvy Talks are, short, uh, uh, are thought uh, short, powerful talks that expand horizons in these times of great transformations. Uh, we have this general theme, interconnection, community and global transformation. And it is a joint initiative uh, from SEB, a network of Buddhist centers and communities around Brazil, and Instituto Caminho do Meio, an institution committed to promote dialogues, activities, and actions for inner and outer transformation. Uh, so in this season, we will have four talks, always between our host and master, Lama Padma Santan, and invited leaders from different parts of the world. Today, the Dr. Jonathan Dawson from Schumacher College, UK. And together with the talks, we are also running a small emerging college with young people who want to engage in global transformation, and they are all here among us. And so to present our guests, I will pass the word to our mediator, Andres Hernandez. Olá, bem-vindo todos e todas. Uh, welcome, everybody. And I want to start with a deep and sincere apology for our late beginning. I wish I could blame someone else, but the blame falls squarely on my shoulder that I, I can't uh, figure out time in the UK. And so uh, we're, we have Jonathan now. And I want to particularly thank Jonathan for his uh, equanimity and his good humor. Um, of uh, We called him in early, then sent him back, and, and he took it all very well. And I also want to thank Lama Santim, who showed up on time and has many things to be doing, and also for uh, his good humor and understanding. So thank you both, and, uh, and also for all our team and the entire Sangha, for the patience of everybody. But uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Jonathan. First, I just want to give a few thank yous because obviously it takes a lot of people to run you know, what appears to be a, a simple Zoom conversation. And we need at least one other person from now on who can check the uh, time zones. But uh, I, I would like to thank uh, um, Bruno Murcino, first and foremost, who is doing, oh, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me, who is doing our simultaneous translation. And uh, this, we, we couldn't do this without Bruno Murcino, so thank you. And we've heard from uh, Bruno Lastorina, who does a million things in the background to make these things happen. Um, on technology and many other things, we have Anna Nedochechko and uh, Camila Amui, and supported by Lucas Arganjo, and uh, critical to make these things work, go out on two channels of YouTube and have everything come together. I don't understand how it all works. Um, Charles Lasturinha, who did the wonderful graphic design, and then, of course, the entire Sangha and the uh, Camino de Mayo and the Instituto de Camino de Mayo for all the support. And as always, Lama Santem for the support and energy to, uh, to make these engagements happen. So, Jonathan is joining us in the middle of a Qigong retreat. And so he very kindly has taken a couple hours off from Qigong walking in the forest to uh, join us. So uh, particularly thankful that uh, he would take time out for us. 
And as you might know, that Jonathan is the project lead for the program of regenerative economics at Schumacher College. And Schumacher College, as you may know, is a wonderful school in the UK founded by Satish Kumar, who uh, bring a much wider view of social and ecological transformation and has luminaries such as Jonathan, Fritjof Capra, uh, Kate Rosworth as uh, on their faculty. And so that's what he's doing now. But uh, we've learned that he actually spent some time here at Camino de Mayo about 12 or 13 years ago as part of Guy Education. So we're, we're so pleased to have him back. And uh, in addition to all this, he was also sometime in the meantime, president of the Global Eco Village Network. And, uh, um, and as well as a longtime resident of Fiendhorn in Scotland. And then he's also done work with small enterprise development as a researcher, consultant, and many other roles across the continent of Africa and Asia. And uh, I know that he doesn't like long introductions, so I'll <laughs> leave it at that. But we're so pleased to have him. And it's a little late in the UK, so we're even more pleased that he'll spend his late evening with us. And so I'm gonna pass it to Jonathan. But before I do, um, for people who've joined us in the past, we're gonna have a slightly different dynamic. That in the past, we have a 20 minute SEBI talk and then a conversation with Lama Samtin. As Jonathan is going to talk about pedagogy today, he didn't just want to stay talking and he wanted to actually embody that a bit more. So we're going to have a, a chance to have a dynamic back and forth. And because we have Bruno Murcini with us, he'll be doing simultaneous translation um, English to Portuguese. So if you are a Portuguese speaker and you would like to speak with Jonathan, just keep speaking Portuguese and magically um, Jonathan is going to be hearing English. And if you're an English speaker and you want to be hearing um, the, the translation, which I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but if, if you are an English speaker and you don't speak Portuguese, um, you can go into the English interpretation site at the bottom. And if you have any questions, just write in chat. So with that, my great pleasure to give the floor to um, Dr. Jonathan Dawson and his talk today is bringing the soul back into the classroom. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, Andres. Um, it is such, it really is such a pleasure to, um, to be invited to come back home almost to, to, to Brazil. Um, I am um, unmuted, good, yeah. Um, so, um, you mentioned the period in my life where I was doing a lot of work in Africa and Asia. And this is a period where I didn't really know, you know, the landing cards you get at the airport, you got to fill in your profession. And um, I kind of, I wondered several times, was I going to, was I going to be arrested for having a different profession going out from when I came in? Like, was I a researcher? Was I a consultant? Was I a, was I, there's any number of things I could have put down. I didn't really know what I was. Um, and shortly after I moved to Findhorn uh, 20 years ago, it landed like my vocation is educator. And so at last I had a title. And I have to say that in my, in my development as an educator, Brazil was enormously important. I was doing quite a lot of work in um, Bahia, Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, Porto Alegre, I think other places as well with Guy Education. And I was like really, as an educator, the, the gift I bring, or the thing I'm particularly interested in, is bringing embodiment back into the classroom, is moving beyond the students being passive observers in a, in a process that's done to them and becoming actively engaged. And I'm particularly interested in the use of theatrical tools in this. Um, you know, very much inspired by the work of people like Paulo Freire and Augusto Boal, Again, the, the economics master's program that I teach, I think is the only one in the world that includes a theater of the oppressed workshop as part of the master's program. Um, and the time that I spent in Brazil was enormously important for me in, um, in developing my craft as an educator because of the fluidity and emotional embodied intelligence of the group and the willingness to play. So we were, I was bringing ideas into the classroom and was finding really receptive, emotionally fluid, intelligent, committed people who were kind of playmates with me oh. as I was trying to develop ways of working that would truly empower the students. So a real, uh, a real debt of gratitude to Brazil and particularly the Gaia education community in Brazil. 
So the two passions that I've got that I'm really working out professionally are economics and education. And I want to begin this talk. The, my aim here really is to throw out some provocations. Um, we just one final word of introduction here is that very much central to the way we work at Schumacher College is it's much more about enabling the students to ask better questions to equip them to be able to, to face what comes at them and to be able to, to think and respond as systems thinkers, as pattern finders, rather than providing solutions or answers, it's much more about enabling the students to equip them to become much more, to be much more elegant, much more intelligent question makers, question formers. Um, there's a, one of the less well um, known quotes from Einstein uh, that I just love in this respect is if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on solving the problem, I'd spend the first 55 minutes getting the question right. Because I know if I've got the right question, I can easily answer it inside five minutes. So I just want to be clear at the beginning that my aim with this little, little introductory talk is not to provide answers, but rather to hopefully to provide clues or provocations about more intelligent ways of addressing the world and bringing better questions to it. So I want to begin with an intersection point where economics and pedagogy meet. Uh, sorry, where economics and, and pedagogy ed education meet. Um, and this is the observation that, that here in Europe, um, I think particularly in Britain, we have a lot of student uh, dissatisfaction with what they're being taught in the economics classroom. And this is manifest in the creation of a number of organizations. So uh, among the students, probably the best known organization in Britain is called Rethinking Economics. Um, there's also an organization called Reteaching Economics, which is very much in support of the students. Um, and I found it really interesting that in looking at the demands of Rethinking Education, that they're almost entirely limited to the curriculum. So, in other words, the, protest, the protest is fundamentally focused on a curriculum that provides only teaching about fundamentalist, fundamental market-driven neoliberal economics. And their, their demand is that they want a different set of textbooks. Now, my reflection on this, immediately I sort of smelled a rat, as we say in English. I said something wasn't quite right. And when I thought about it, it was the it was the, the inherent assumption that changing one set of textbooks for another set of textbooks was going to cure the problem. And I thought, huh, that is a really interesting, not that I believe that they had deeply thought about it. I think that rather that simply the pedagogical dimension of economics is largely invisible to us. So there are practices and techniques that of practice in the classroom that are simply they're invisible to us because we just assume that's how education happens. And this is really what I've been, so what I dived into then was um, like already my suspicion was because in the work I'd been doing in Brazil and Findhorn, I'd already come to the conclusion that simply changing one set of textbooks for another is not gonna solve the problem. Um, so um, I wanna give just one example of what I mean by this. Um, one of the, the early experiments I was working with at Findhorn was teaching ecological footprints. So ecological fo footprint, I think it's the same expression in Brazil, is simply the, the load that, that, that we as a species, um, the, 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 the ecological cost of the human activities. So even like when I was doing this 20 years ago, even then, the ecological impact was huge, was shocking. So with this education about ecological footprints, I would, like I'm a pretty good storyteller. So I was bringing in attractively, finding really good anecdotes to convey the, the weight, the, 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 so for example, um, ecological footprints analysis tells us that if everyone on the planet were to live the, the lifestyle of the average North America, we'd need five planets. In Western Europe, it's about three and a half. So this is shocking stuff. So I would teach this stuff and I would notice that the students got it, but they didn't really get it. 
like they had a better store of after dinner anecdotes. But in terms of did it move them? Did it transform them? Did it was their behavior change? Almost not at all. So what I observed was that the students would, and this wasn't just the students, it was also myself, would know a lot more data. But in terms of like when you when you come face to face with the weight, the ecological weight of the human presence upon the earth, it is shocking. The, the, the appropriate response is catharsis, is anger, is emotional engagement. But this simply wasn't happening. And I was really fascinated by this. So I'd noticed that, that the students, that, that within a couple of hours, it was almost as if the lecture hadn't happened. So they got the data, but something was missing in terms of the link between the data and their emotional embodied response. And this really fascinated me. So I began with a colleague at Findhorn experimenting and the, the very first experiment was simply creating, going to the village lawn, the village green in Findhorn and creating four circles. So the one circle was North America, which was just a huge circle of people fingertip to fingertip. The next circle was a Western European circle, which was also very generous, but not quite as expansive. Third was Central America, Central Europe, which was significantly smaller. And the last one was an African circle, which was tight bodies just together. And immediately there was anger, there was passion, there was frustration, there were tears. And you know where this led me, of course, was to recognize that, that the body in the Western tradition is seen as largely being a vehicle for transporting around the brain. Whereas in fact, what my experience was telling me was that access to the emotions and to the body were actually the gateway to deeply getting it. Um, so this was, this is, as I said at the beginning, was where my work in Brazil was so important, being able to work with really willing um, folk who were willing to move beyond simply sitting in class and being lectured at and rather to participate not just with their intellects, but with their bodies, with their emotions, with their intuition as well. So already from that experience and from several others in Findhorn in, in Brazil and also in uh, laterally in Schumacher, already I had the experience, like I knew from my personal experience that, um, that for there to be real full engagement of the whole person in the process of learning, we need to move beyond simply intellectual cognitive learning. Important though that is, but there's many other dimensions we need to activate. So I already had this experience as a teacher, as an educator, um, but what I then did was I devoted several years to a deep study of learning theory to see how I could link up the theory to my own experience as an educator. And what I came up with is that, and this is to come back to the pedagogy, what I described before as being the largely invisible, invisible because it's just so taken for granted, that's what education looks like. It looks like kids sitting in rows with a teacher talking at them and then taking notes and then doing their homework and then competitively engaging in a process of getting good marks. So this is, is this not true? This is how education looks. So. I started unpicking this and think and looking for what are the core assumptions underlying this story of pedagogy. And I came up with three. And I noticed that as I communicate these three to colleagues, you know, as it becomes, as it becomes, as they begin to question these three core assumptions, their absurd dysfunctional, the, the, the absurd dysfunctional nature of these three assumptions kind of becomes clear and they often kind of end up laughing. So the first one is that there is a fixed body of knowledge to be transmitted from the educator to the passive student. So knowledge is not co-created. There is a fixed body of knowledge to be transmitted. Um, even though uh, more than a hundred years ago, my compatriot, uh, the Irish poet W.B. Yeats said education is not the filling of a pail, a pail is a bucket. Education is not the filling of a pail, it is the, it is the, it is the creation of a spark. So despite that, the dominant pedagogical ethic, I would say globally, 
is that there is a center, there, there is a fixed body of knowledge to be communicated from the educator to a largely passive group of students. Second one is one I've alluded to already is the idea that the only learning, the only legitimate learning faculty is the intellect. So emotions are not welcome in the classroom. The body is a vehicle for transporting around the brain. And the idea that the, that the body or the intuition or the emotions could be a key source of new knowledge, uh, simply not part of the picture. This is beginning to be challenged. So there's a thinker, uh, a thinker in the US called, um, hmm, his name will come to me, um, but he is a neuro linguist and he is persuaded that all new knowledge comes in through the body and is then transferred through the use of metaphor to other learning faculties. George Lakoff is the guy's name. So, and certainly my own experience is that in terms of moving beyond a cognitive understanding to a transformative understanding, like really deeply getting it, requires emotional and embodied engagement. And then the third assumption, which I think is probably the craziest of all, is that education is a private individual competitive pursuit and that collaboration is called cheating. <laughs> so I kind of have to laugh at these. So I just want to run through those again. The idea that, um, that there is a fixed body of knowledge to be transmitted, that the intellect is the only legitimate learning vehicle and that Education is not a community based, but rather a collaborative, but rather an individual pursuit. Um, and, I, and I mean, it seems to me that when I look at these, it's kind of, well, of course, these are not true. Of course, these are not legitimate or useful. But they continue to dominate educational practice largely because they're invisible, because we just think this is how education happens. How, long, how am I doing so far? Am I, are you still with me? Is this making sense? Good. Thank you. So, so what would an education see? Sí, sí. What would an education look like that called into question these three assumptions and actually addressed them and 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 overthrew them? Um, and I just want to give so so already I've talked about the the example of the. Uh, the ecological footprints and being a, bringing in a theatrical embodied dimension into the learning. So the bodies are actually actively participating in the learning process. Um, again, I think, um, in fact, I, I don't think, I'm sure that this is the, 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 our regenerative economic master's program at Schumacher is the only one in the world that involves a, sol uh, a solo overnight fasting vigil in the forest. Isn't that great economics class? Um, and this is because if we, so let's, let's ask the question, what is the problem, that, what fundamentally is the problem we're addressing? And it seems to me that the response of the, the response of the rethinking economics, the response that they would give, the response that is inherent in their response that we just want to change the textbooks is that what we want to do, the nature of the problem is neoliberal free market economics free market. It's not free at all, but it's what they call free market. Um, my deep belief is that we can go much deeper than that. And I think we're going to go all the way back to Plato. And the, 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 the beginning of the philosophical tra tra tradition that is woven right through the whole Judeo-Christian lineage that again is so deeply embedded that we've stopped even seeing it, of separation, of the, the creation of a, of a dualism between mind and body, between self and other, between uh, rationality and emotion. And, and that somehow the, the, the one true reality is not the material, but the spiritual. And this, I think that most in most, um, mystic traditions, there is this recognition. It's often called the myth of separation. This is the real problem we have at the moment. I think this is the core problem. So 
It's something that Otto Sharma in his theory U has really looked at in depth. What he, it's what he calls the three divides. So the one divide is self from the other than human world, which enables us to behave towards the other than human world as we do, as a destructive species, as a destructive civilization rather than a destructive species, because there are other cultures that have a different, and you, you know this in Brazil, that have a very different relationship to the other than human world that is not characterized by separation. So separation from the other than human world, separation from other human beings in ways that have enabled slavery and the kind of modern slavery and the, 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 the way that we behave towards each other, that um, kind of normalizing a level of disrespect, huge inequality in the, in the human family. And finally, the division of self from self manifested in isolation, loneliness, uh, the crisis of meaning, which again is, is manifest in record levels of suicide and depression and uh, drug medication. So it seems to me that, 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 that for us to make the seismic shift, like we, we need another Copernican moment, like the, the age of Copernicus where the paradigm shifted dramatically as a result of his um, celestial observations, totally changing the story of, um, uh, I mean, challenging the dominant Christian story of the era that the response of the Catholic Church was to reach for the Inquisition to shut him up. And of course he recanted. But we need a moment of equal civilizational impact that, was, that is addressing the core separation of humans from the other than human world, from each other, and from, uh, from, from ourselves. And it seems to me that just changing a set of textbooks for another set of textbooks is not going to do it. It's necessary, but we need to be looking at a pedagogy that deeply engages the students in the co-creation of learning, that allows them to bring their whole person to the classroom, their body, their emotions, as well as their intellect, and that fundamentally locates the educational process within communities. And this is really what we're doing at, uh, at Schumacher College. Um, just one more little story here is that we had a, a very eminent professor um, who is one of the founders of the research method called Action Research, a guy called Peter Reason. And he was, he was in a session with us on research methods and he said this thing, and then he proceeded and we said, whoa, Peter, come back. That was crazy. What did you, what did you just said? And what he said was that in his experience, and he was speaking to a group of economics and science students. And what he said was that in his experience, even with students studying subjects like economics and science, that in almost every case, their dissertation, their choice of a dissertation topic was related in some way to their quest for self-healing. Now, this is beautiful, and it's a validation that, that I think intuitively we kind of go, well, of course, but it totally contradicts the dominant story, the dominant civilizational story, which is that effectively we are, we are thinking machines that could pick any subject at random, nothing to do with our subjectivity. In fact, our subjectivity is not allowed into the classroom. You put the first person pronoun in your papers, red pen. Um, we not only give permission to the student to use the first person pronoun, we insist that they do so. The assessed learning outcomes for all the modules include the question, what are you bringing to this inquiry? Become deeply conscious of your engagement with this inquiry and track how it is impacting your personal journey. So, let me see. Yeah, so almost done. How are we doing time-wise? Yeah, looking good. Okay. So um, I think, so the, the, when we have a training budget, a staff training budget, I spend my staff training budget on theater, constellations, um, work that is enabling the student to, that is encouraging the student to bring their whole person to the classroom. Um, I just I want to give one little example, which which maybe it's finishing where I started, 
um, which is a real tribute to to the, the the way we worked in Brazil. This was something that I developed with a group or that we collectively developed. So the way that I work, the, the way that we work, the center of gravity, the center of authority moves from the educator to the learning community. So I, I reject the terms. My business card says senior lecturer in economics. I reject it. You know, I do occasionally lecture because it is useful, but for the most part, my job is to create a learning context in which the learning community can flourish. So the center of gravity, the center of authority shifts from the educator to the class. As Brazilians, you know this from Freire, it's, 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 it's very clear. Um, but with this one exercise we did in Brazil, which I think will give a really good, tangible example, kind of taking a lot of the theoretical stuff I've been talking about and putting it into a very real context. We were working with two bits of data. So the first was, um, let me just get this for you. Yep. So the in conventional market-based economic theory, there is the assumption that GDP, gross domestic product, economic growth, will translate directly into well-being. So this is unquestioned, the, the, the assumption. So once a year, our finance ministers used to stand up and say the economy grew by 3% last year. They, they no longer do that because we're not growing. But they used to say the economy grew by 3% each year uh, or last year. And really, they don't need to say any more because we do the rest of the work for them because we've so deeply absorbed this story that economic growth translates into well-being. So the two concepts that we, that we were playing with were one, there are many things that go through the market that are inimical, that are actually hostile to, to, to well-being. Oil spills, wars, defense industry, corruption. And similarly, there are many things that are essential to well-being that do not pass through the market. Childcare, volunteering, the care economy. So we recognized, again, looking at the data that that if, if a price were to, I, I reject the term um, ecosystem services, but if you simply think of if we were academically, if we were to put a monetary value on the services provided to us for free by nature, how much would that be compared to what is the size of GDP? So give one little example is that Chinese uh, in northern China, where there's been severe ecological disruption, uh, there are armies of workers who are pollinating the crops by hand because there's no pollinators, natural pollinators left. So just one example, the many, many services that nature provides to us for free. How, if we were to put a monetary value on that, what, how would that compare to the GDP? And the conclusion we came to is that it was about double. This is most of the authoritative studies um, put the value, global valuation of ecosystem services at about double the current size of GDP. So then a similar question came up, how if we give a monetary value to all of the free, the gift economy work that is done, the volunteering, childcare, uh, what's often considered to be women's work or is often left with women, how would that compare to GDP? And again, we looked at a number of different studies that suggested that in most of, the, at least most of the industrialized countries, it would be about two thirds of GDP. So we were working with this and what we came to was that this feels like, a, like an iceberg. So the bit that is visible at the top in the economics profession is what passes through the market. But most of the iceberg is made up of what nature gives us for free and then there's another significant layer of what people do for free that actually, but these are invisible, they're below the surface. So we were trying to work with this about how can we do this at how, so we've got the data. How can we play with this theatrically so that actually this deeply enters and we really get it. So what we did was we created on the floor of the classroom, an iceberg with our bodies in proportion to those three different layers. So about half the iceberg was 
ecosystem services. So people were representing ecosystems. There was then another further tranche of people who were representing the, the gift economy, the unpaid economy, the non-monetized economy. And then at the top, there was a relatively small number of people representing GDP. The first two groups were sitting down facing one way and those representing GDP were standing up facing the other way. I hope I've managed to convey that um, constellation. And then the invitation was release your thinking mind for the moment, release your known ideological positions. How does this feel in your body? So people were being invited to invite empathic identification with other than human species and with the non-monetized economy. And out of this arose a tremendous conversations, dialogue, experiments with moving position um, that, that the students remembered long after they had no longer got access to the technical data because they had the embodied experience of, of seeing in a material embodied way the relationship between the three different elements of the iceberg. I do hope I've managed to convey that. Um, so one final comment is you already have got from everything I've said that the, that the at, at Schumacher College, the, the education is very much about going upstream. So not looking at the, I mean, recognizing that occasionally we need to, to address the consequences of dysfunctional systems, but fundamentally going upstream to, to ask how, that what are the core patterns that are manifesting downstream so dysfunctionally so that we can go upstream to, um, to address problems at the root. So I, I think I've spoken longer than I intended to. Um, much more interested in conversation than in just listening to myself speak. So I hope I've offered some interesting, thought-provoking ideas. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, if anyone would like to join me in a digital applause, I prefer the floating ice cream cone myself. So please uh, join me in uh, exploding ice cream cones or hands or thumbs. What's, what's this other one? Hearts. We should probably do hearts because that's, that's very embodied. All right. So uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. And now we'll move to uh, a second part of our session tonight. And it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Lama Samtem. I know for most people who are uh, participating today, Lama Samtem needs no introduction, but for uh, anyone who might not, that uh, as most know, Lama Samtem is the leader of the network of SEBI communities around Brazil and uh, was once a professor of physics at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, and uh, also a, a very critical activist, particularly with nuclear power at a critical time in Brazil. And I, I'm told that uh, made some very critical impacts at, at being the right person at the right time. So it's my great uh, pleasure to invite them both to be spotlighted in the center and I'll uh, give it to Lama Samtem to uh, go ahead and uh, lead the questioning. And Lama Samtem, I, I think you're free to uh, keep your English or speak in Portuguese. And Camila, can you spotlight both Jonathan and uh, the Lama? Thank you. Perfect. Gostaria de dizer minha alegria de ver aqui o Jonathan, que esteve no, no Sul, eu acho que foi um ou dois anos, uma coisa assim. Vocês estão ouvindo? O som está ok? Sim, lá. Jonathan, are you, are you hearing the English translation well? Eu estou ouvindo. Eu achei assim maravilhosa a apresentação do Jonathan, foi rápida, né? mas assim ainda muito consistente, muito, muito adequada. 
eu vou fazer uma, um breve comentário sobre isso e vou fazer uma pergunta. Eu acho, especialmente, esse ponto, os vários pontos que ele trouxe, eu achei muito, muito importante. Eu acho essa questão, por exemplo, da economia não financeira, eu acho um ponto crucial. A entidade da Dalai Lama ele tem enfatizado isso, que o mundo não é regido pela economia, ainda é regido pela compaixão. Essencialmente, a compaixão tem uma economia social, o cuidado das pessoas, o cuidado em todas as direções, se considera que é a base da economia, é a base da nossa vida, essencialmente. E a economia ela não leva isso em consideração. Entendeu? Então, eu acho isso um ponto especial. É que, nesse momento, nós estamos vivendo no Brasil uma tensão interessante, porque nós temos uma grande seca no país, temos na parte sul do país, e isso está tensionando o agronegócio e a indústria. A indústria precisa da energia, das barragens para produzir energia elétrica barata, enquanto uh, o agronegócio precisa bombear a água para a irrigação. Então, nós temos mas nenhum deles é capaz de dizer que tudo isso começa na Amazônia, com esse trabalho que não é considerado economicamente computável, que é justamente fazer a atmosfera, trazer a água para a atmosfera e fazer os rios correrem. Esse é um ponto muito interessante que os ecologistas estão trazendo, o tempo todo, mas nós vamos ao mesmo tempo cortando a floresta e reduzindo essa possibilidade de nós termos os rios aéreos que vão irrigar os rios que fluem no chão. Então, eu acho que a gente estaria, provavelmente, num linear de efetivamente considerar a economia num sentido muito mais amplo, muito além da economia financeira. Com certeza. Eu achei também muito interessante esse aspecto de não trazer apenas a, a dimensão da educação no aspecto cognitivo, intelectual, mas trazer as emoções e o corpo como uma questão crucial. Não sei se o Jonathan está con tá conseguindo acompanhar, se a tradução está ok, está tudo bem. Deixa eu ver. Yeah. Is the invitation for me to come in? Just to see if you... It's okay for you. Are you listening? Okay. Then uh, you follow up. Uh, <clears throat> uh, pessoalmente, dentro dos ensinamentos do Bíblia, esse tema da emoção é um tema crucial. Nós associamos isso não apenas à emoção, mas à energia. Então, a, a cognição ela é potencializada pela energia. Apenas a cognição ela não tem força, ela precisa estar dirigida pela energia. Então, o ponto da energia é um ponto crucial. Então, quando nós estamos no processo de educação, nós precisamos educar a capacidade de dirigir a própria energia. Então, pro, a educação, na perspectiva do Buda, em primeiro lugar, é não, é não nos deixar flutuando com os vários episódios de energia nos arrastando em várias direções. E a gente tem uma capacidade de manifestar essa energia a partir de uma base lúcida, de uma base uh, que tenha um nível de lucidez. Esse ponto, o que, que seria lucidez, é algo que vai sendo progressivamente desenvolvido, vai sendo progressivamente ampliado, até a lucidez de um Buda. Mas nós deveríamos evitar, saltitar em direção às coisas que simplesmente nos chamam a atenção, que é essencialmente o diagnóstico que nós fazemos na sociedade atual, que a sociedade nos convida a movimentar a energia em direção ao consumo, a coisas desconectadas, e nós perdemos totalmente a base, perdemos uma base de lucidez. Então é muito importante que no processo de educação o corpo e as emoções elas estejam dentro. Eu agradeço que ele tenha, que o Jonathan tenha trazido esse tema. Isso realmente me parece de grande importância. A questão que eu teria é uma das áreas que nós trabalhamos também. É como que nós podemos movimentar a energia de um modo coletivo, de um modo social. Que a educação não seja apenas um processo 
individual, onde nós movimentamos a energia a partir de uma base lúcida, mas que a gente seja capaz de construir um tecido social onde a energia também é respondida de forma lúcida uh, coletivamente, de forma mais ampla. Né? No sentido budista, a mente ampla, a mente individual ou a mente coletiva é essencialmente a mente. Então, esse é um ponto importante. A coletividade ela funciona como se fosse um indivíduo também. Então, nós precisamos uh, desenvolver na perspectiva budista, desenvolver as terras puras, ou seja, as visões de mundo que tenham lucidez, que brotem de uma base lúcida. E isso produz naturalmente todo o processo mental, cognitivo, intelectual, em direção à construção de mundos melhores. Naturalmente, sem nenhum tipo de repressão. Então, esse seria o ponto. Eu acho que o Kindle Horner tem esse expertise, eu acho que a educação Gaia tem esse expertise. Né? Eu queria ouvir também o Jonathan, como é que ele vê isso, como é que ele sente esse aspecto da, da ação coletiva, da inteligência coletiva. Thank you for the question. The, the, the first thing I would say is that a really important part of my personal journey was sitting in Budgaya um, for weeks in silent meditation retreats and learning so much, being so enriched by the Dharma and particularly meta meditation for me was just so important in terms of, in terms of moving beyond the abstract love of humanity into a deep, much more personal contact. And I think I, I love the terms barefoot doctor, barefoot educator, barefoot economist. I think, I think that certainly in the case of Europe, and I suspect strongly in Brazil as well, that the university is seen as being, seen as being alien and really mysterious to people, particularly people who are more marginalized, who are more disadvantaged that generally the university sits like this ivory tower in the middle of communities that it has no contact with. And it seems to me that the way to, that some of the most exciting educational initiatives I've seen are where the students are in some sort of community service to the communities around them. So that their own, and in my experience, the students love it, the communities love it, and the NGOs they're working with love it because the university then becomes is no longer a place where students are just studying the theories to do with marginalization and oppression and inequality, but are working tangibly hand in hand with the very people who are suffering these conditions, who are experiencing these conditions. So for me, in terms of how do we get the energy, how do we move the energy in education beyond bored students sitting cramming for exams <laughs> into a living, vibrant experience it is to to take down the walls that divide the university from the surrounding communities and how you see that we can uh, make a movement beyond the, the individual but uh, uh, how we can uh, make the changes with all population, with a group. How can a group um, um, arrive at a position, ecological position, for example? A group How of students, or a group of students, or a group of other than students? People. People. Okay. So let me give you some examples from. This is from the current year. We're coming towards the end of this academic year for our regenerative economics program. One thing that uh, you, you will know about Brexit, I'm sure, that we, for some reason, and somehow voted to leave the European Union. One of the, like looking for a silver lining, looking for any single, any possible advantage in doing this, the one that we're looking at is to do with agricultural subsidies. So conventionally in Europe, agricultural subsidies are given, 60% of the European budget is agricultural subsidies. And this is mostly given for putting for farmers who just leave land untouched, called set aside. They set aside land. So in other words, the rich farmers get tons of money. 
So with leaving the European Union, we're now in a position that we can, we in Britain can create our own, we can change the subsidy system. And incredibly, this right-wing government is changing the system towards a much more ecologically based approach. So in other words, farmers will get, will get uh, subsidies for pro-environmental activities. So one of our groups of students was working with local farmers as part of the program, asking how can you, how can you transform your farming operation in such a way that it will be, that your farms will be more a resource to the community and will be generating lots of ecological benefits. And so this was the students leaving the ivory tower of the university, working with people in the wider community to question how can we make the new changes in government policy really work in terms of social, community, ecological benefits. I hope that anecdote may have gone some way to answering your question. The question we have uh, <clears throat> with respect to, for example, we understand this. We're understanding this, the question. We're understanding that we have to change our approach. Yeah. But uh, why the people keep doing the same thing? Huh. <laughs> we can, uh, we can uh, talk with one person and other person and other person. But uh, why the body of the community doesn't change? Do you know, th this is a very context specific, like the reasons in Brazil are gonna be different from the reasons in, in, in Europe. Um, but um, how can we communicate? How can we uh, um, yeah. help that change? Yeah. yeah, Maybe we are in a theoretical position that yeah. it is better. But everybody feels other way. Yeah. They, they keep doing, they keep feeling that uh, the regular economy, uh, the financial economy is, uh, is the, what uh, makes uh, the things really meaningful. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. For example, we have now, uh, in the United States recently, we had Trump. But we, we, we have still Trump. Trump is, you know, how can happen this in Brazil? How same. can Trump happen? <laughs> yeah, the, the, how the people can uh, can imagine flat Earth? How can the people get attached uh, socially in groups uh, with uh, very old ideas? How is it possible? For example, they are now promoting. Uh, uh, short vision and uh, uh, violence and the short vision. Socially, they are promoting this. And how is it possible? You know, we see a crowd of people going, uh, coming back, coming back, making the reverse direction. Yeah. And uh, it's clear for us what we have to be done. But maybe uh, we have to learn other things that we are not seeing. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I've got one single answer to your question. I think that, um, like, what I'd like to offer is that I think at the minute there is a lot of fear. And, um, I mean, certainly looking, looking at Brazil, looking at the United States, the political situation, there is a lot of fear. In Europe, a lot of fear around uh, refugees, migrants. Yeah. And... and um, and we're seeing, certainly in the case of Europe with the migrants, there are two very different approaches, different responses. So one response is very generous and open-hearted and supportive, and the other is exactly the opposite. Now, how do we, how do we help people move beyond fear? And it seems to me that this is, or how do, how do we find a way to, to people, for people to be less reacting from fear and I think here we're in the realms of, 
of spirituality. I mean, certainly, the, I think the it's a question I might ask you as a Buddhist: is how do we how do we listen intelligently? How do we really show loving kindness in such a way as that the 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 hard, violent, fearful response becomes less less reactive? Um, I mean, there is an economic dimension to the question as well, but my first response is to do with, I mean, I think take coming back to the eco-village movement, that I think one of the things that eco-villages do really well, communities do, do really well. The community, I've, for the last 20 years, I've lived in intentional communities and eco-villages. And I think the one thing that we do really well is deep listening, is working with conflict, um, process work that is really enabling all the voices to be heard, um, conscious communication. But I'm afraid I'm not able to reach into my head and come out with one big meta answer. I think this is one of the characteristics of the age we live in. When we uh find a small community, like uh, uh, suddenly we realized that a group of people have invaded an area around the, the Buddhist temple. How can we help them to work better for achieving that, uh, uh, what they want to achieve? Then we have a practical thing, how we can sit in a, in a in a circle and uh, discuss and arrive at a common position. I think uh, the education process uh, uh, in the community have to start this, in this point. Mm. Have to bring um, good dreams. Have to bring good dreams. The good dreams will drive the energy and drive the intelligence for good action. These are you mean in the community surrounding the Buddhist monastery? Is that right? Yes. It happened in the beginning of uh, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Almost 20 years ago. It happened. Then we developed that connection with them. Mm. And we have a very practical, uh, very practical uh, problem. But it is the same with the people around. Uh, it is the same with the ecological question. The same with the uh, the non uh, non financial economy. It is the same with the young people that are in the school. They don't want to make the, the same thing the father and mother did. Mm. They want to construct other things, but they are pressed. They are pressed like ourselves. We are in a city. We cannot, we don't know where go our, our storage. We don't know uh, where the litter go. Mm. Mm. We are in a, in a kind of uh, big organism that makes mm. us to do bad things without option. Yes, yes. Yes. Then we have to address that the big question, how to dream good dreams, everybody. If you look at the wars, first and second wars, the people doesn't like to, to, to die in the war, but they are dragged in that direction. Incredible. You ask very big philosophical questions. In Buddhism, we start with the first noble truth. The, the first and second noble truth bring naturally the third. And we see that we don't need that suffering. And when we see this, we realize that the compassion uh, is a, a movement. The movement of compassion appears. Because we see that we, uh, we see a lot of suffering, and we see why, and we see that it's not necessary. 
And then we are driven naturally by compassion. Compassion is not something to, to learn. It's something that appears. Of course, of course, yes. You need to leave the classroom. <laughs> yeah. I think I think you were answering you were answering your own questions much better than I could. I don't know because it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> it's not working. Is it not working? <laughs> it's not working. Not working. <laughs> <laughs> I can jump in for a second. Uh, Lana, do uh, we should probably start winding up a little bit so Jonathan has time with the students. Do you have one giant philosophical question? No uh, more giant philosophical questions. <laughs> no, it's the matter. Jonathan said we have to improve the question. <laughs> I'm trying to improve the question. <laughs> oh, Jonathan, looks like you're reaping what you sow here. <laughs> I, honestly, honestly, I'm beginning to regret. No, I, I think that um, that. Um, that in terms of like I'm not going to say anything new, but I think that the the trick is that is that we live in at least here we live in abstract lives where we know the theories, we know the data, but we don't have the embodied heart opening experience. Um, and and I think the the and I think I, I want to return to the idea of the barefoot economist, the barefoot llama, the barefoot educator as someone who is embedded within their community and who is not at an abstract distance but actually within heart opening human contact and when we have that much else will follow what do you think Lana are you satisfied with that or uh... yes. <laughs> I'm so happy that uh, Jonathan exists and this is <laughs> it's so wonderful. We need the do it. Thank you, Jonathan. Many of us are happy that both of you exist. Yes, so indeed. I'd like to invite everyone to do another round of digital applause or hearts or whatever uh, you need to do. Even siphon through a couple. I, I still like the exploding ice cream cone, but I'm, I'm going to move to hearts because of Jonathan. Great. So, um, Lama, is it okay if we kind of wind up a little bit? Yes. All right. Well, thank you both. And thank you, Jonathan, for joining us and uh, being in the hot seat with uh, uh, making better questions about impossible things. <laughs> and thank everybody for coming and the song for all the support. And I'm sure that these conversations will uh, echo in our communities and beyond for, uh, for quite a while. So thank you. And uh, Jonathan, if I can remind you, because we've had uh, all, the, all the difficulties today, that uh, we're going to go to another Zoom room. I sent you the address, and we'll, we'll, have a short, uh, we'll have a short session with students who will ask you large philosophical questions. As well. <laughs> no more. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. <practical. laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. A real pleasure, as always. And uh, Bruno, can you tell us about uh, the next SETI talk? Yes, so in about uh, a month, uh, we will have our third uh, meeting in this series with Roshi Enkio Hara from New York. Uh, she is one of the founding persons of the Zen Peacemakers Movement, and she will be here talking with Lama and with us. All right. So uh, I wish everybody a wonderful beginning of winter here in Brazil, beginning of summer in the Northern Hemisphere and hope to see everyone in a month. Take care. Bye. Bye.